Kia ora koutou, uh, ko Tongariro te maringa, ko Taupo te uh, Moana, ko um, Tokanu te Marae, uh, ko Ngāti Tuwharito uh, Ngā Puhi Aku Iwi, uh, ko Eorangi uh, te maringa, ko Waimakariri te Awa, uh, ko um, Ngāti Māmoe Ngāi Tahu Aku Iwi, uh, ko JT Mupatataku Inga, uh, ko Jade, Makai, Ezra, Preach, Modu, uh, Aku, Tamariki, ko Wakitimi Pada, um, Tolaga Bay, uh, Opotiki, um, Takutani. So, uh, Nordata, Tina Koto, Kato. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, I love coming here. I love it so much. I rolled around in mud all day yesterday. It was awesome. Um, I probably still smell like it, but, so if you come and give me a hug or a high five later, you'll be able to smell it all over me. Um, I really, I love being up here. There's something really special about the Modi of this place. You're very fortunate, um, the ones who live here, to get to smell and live in this. And as soon as I get off the plane, I go, like this and just breathe it in and everyone thinks that I'm crazy, especially my kids when we come here, they're like, why are the windows up? Why do you always drive with the windows down? Um, and I've got my head hanging out the window, you know, and I'm just enjoying every moment of it. Uh, my husband's whanau is from Portiki and Tolaga Bay um, and some of my, um, my husband's whanau live here. Um, so I always love reconnecting back to this place and um, have my lovely auntie Paula to tow talk with me today um, and she lives here with um, her husband and yesterday I got to enjoy and visit um, some really cool things that are happening here which obviously you guys already know about um, Waka is it Waka Wera Wera? Uh, I went there and um, had a look at their marakai, just the, the small one that they've got there um, I wrote a story a few years ago about that one, so it was nice to see the change and how it's actually being utilised. It's only a small, um, a small one for the, the villagers there, but um, I went around spotting lots of lots of changes and eating the corn there, and um, you know you have such a, a rich diversity of, of food here, and um, that's actually really why I like visiting as well. That I you know get to enjoy all of that. So. Um, a bit of background, you can probably hear that I roll my R's, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very deep south um, thing that we, that we do. Uh, I was born in Invercargill and um, I was born to teenage parents who had a bit of a hard time keeping it together and, um, and I spent lots of time with my grandparents for those reasons. Uh, I had two exceptional grandmothers who have passed away, um, but I had two really amazing and still have two really amazing grandfathers. Uh, one is Pākehā, he is, um, he hugs you like, you know, like he's going to break your back. He is really tough, like he's really strong, um, physically really strong. He turns 80 next month, we're going down for his birthday. He has been a oyster, a bluff oyster uh, catcher, shucker, fisherman for all of his life. Um, he's really amazing. He is real old school, like, you know, if your pants are broken, you put a piece of rope around it, you know, which is cool when you're a kid, but when you're 16 and you lose a button, and he's just like put rope around it, which is not so cool. Um, he gave me lots of really amazing, um, insights into the natural world, especially around Kaimoana um, and um, how to not take too much from the land. That was always his kaupapa, it was incredible and still is to this day. So all the oysters that he shucked over the years, he'd bring them all home and that was what his driveway was made out of. He'd gr um, grind them all down and give them to the chickens for, the, for grit. Um, he had 10 acres when I was a kid and um, he had pigs and chickens and cows and these cute little baby calves and I went out to his farm for such a long time for most weekends and fed these calves and then one day I ate the calf without knowing about it sitting at uh, dinner and it turned me into a vegetarian for quite some time after that but um, he was a really waste not want not kind of um, guy and 
I picked up a lot of his character as, as far as that goes. Um, my Māori grandfather, who's Tūwhare Tōa, Ngā Pohi, um, was born in Tūrangi, so not too far from here. Um, left and went to the South Island when he was in his 20s. Um, but he, he come from a really big whānau here, and um, he always had this really amazing mentality of putting food anywhere that it could go in an urban setting. So he, um, he moved from his, um, where he raised my father and his brothers into apartments around Invercargill. He was down there for quite some time, but he had food everywhere, you know, growing on the porch, um, growing around the windowsills, outside a tiny little patio, but there'd be a lemon tree and just food was just everywhere. So I grew up um, not knowing any different really, not knowing that there was a disconnect with food, which I'm, I'm very grateful for and I was very fortunate. Um, they didn't really vary too much, my, both my grandfathers, they were kind of potatoes, tomatoes, um, silver beet, cabbage, carrots, that was about it. Um, but they were meat and three veg anyway, so you know, change it up a bit. Um, and so they, they didn't really experiment with lots of, with lots of other things. Um, I moved away from Invercargill when I was 18. I, we had a stint up here. We lived in um, the Waikato for about three years and I was about nine, um, or about eight, and lived in Maungatauteri on the par there. Um, so we'd go down and, and catch the fresh um, water coda and make dams to catch them. And I had a really awesome childhood around kai and um, getting it straight from the source. My grandfather would bring, <laughs> this always makes everyone laugh, especially if they like it, he'd bring sacks of bluff oysters to the house. And I'd be like, ugh, you know, I hated yeah. them. And um, he would, we just, we had kai everywhere all the time. Um, on my father's mother's side where uh, Titi birders, mutton bird birders. Uh, so we come from um, a line of chiefs that um, carry their ancestry through blood of being able to collect and harvest those. Um, so basically I just grew up on powers, bluff oysters, mutton birds and crayfish. It was horrible, absolutely horrible. <laughs> and it really was, I hated it, I absolutely hated it. I was like, oh yuck, oysters. Oh yeah, crayfish. Oh yeah, mutton birds. Um, which is really strange now because that's actually all I ate. But um, you know, when you're a kid, you you, you don't connect the um, the fucker puffer of those things as well until we actually really need it. So I moved away from there and moved up to Christchurch. Met my husband, and he was living in Ashburton, and moved down there. Had a baby really young, I was 18. Um, my husband's a bit older than me, and I tried to make the best with what I could do. Um, like I say, I was really raised by my grandfathers, so I didn't really have too much mothering done to me, so I didn't really know what to do. Um, but I knew deep down in my heart that um, I had a responsibility and I was going to do the best that I could with it. So um, I started learning everything that I could about giving birth and what it's going to be like being a mum and this is, you know, before the internet and Google and so I had to go to the library and, um, and I just really wanted to do the best that I could. So we had a baby and um, then got married and um, I was really young and made those steps really fast and um, I was 20 when I got married and then I was pregnant with my second daughter and um, when she was a bit younger she had a, um, an adverse reaction to her vaccination and it really, um, it really made me question what I was actually putting into her body and the chemicals that were going on and I just I really needed to know more because now I actually had a problem that I had to try to fix and like I say back then it was very different from now um, there wasn't a lot of research around what you can do she stopped develop um, her development really delayed at that time and I was 21 and didn't really know where to start and so um, I got out lots of books from the library and talked to people and it wasn't a conversation that was um, had very easily then. Still it was a bit, you know, of a hot topic. 
Um, but I just decided to start eliminating things from our life um, that would be harmful, so chemicals and things. So I started um, taking chemicals out of the house, um, so shampoos and conditioners and things. I changed everything and started making them. Um, I started making beauty products. I started making just anything that I could to avoid. This is a wee bit kind of eco store was coming in then, but it wasn't, you know, like that that, that was the only alternative. Um, and it was quite pricey then as well. So I just um, started looking into how I could eliminate things like, you know, started using <coughs> vinegar to wash everything down and just, you know, really um, simple old school housewives tales of how to get stains out with a coin, I don't know, I'm just making it up. But you know, like just really basic things. And then I thought, okay, this is cool, I've got this sorted. Um, I actually need to start looking at our Kai because you know, lots of things had a thousand, um, you know, letters in it that I couldn't even pronounce, let alone understand what they were. So I started looking at our Kai and around that time I thought, I'm sure I could grow some food. It must be really easy, you shove it in the ground and water it every now and again and it grows and um, so I rang up both my grandfathers and I was like right I need to learn how to grow some things they're just like oh yeah I was like so do I just shove it in the ground and water it and they're just like okay no you actually got to do a wee bit more than that I said oh how long does this take and um, they said oh you know you got to be patient I was like you know I'm not patient this needs to happen straight away um, Anyway, my grandfather who lived in Christchurch came down and, and, and just spoke to me about, you know, what you need to do to the soil and, um, and really helped me along my way. I kind of have a bit of an obsessive compulsive issue going on because then I started turning everything into vegetables, everything that I possibly could, out by the letterbox, just anywhere that I could. And um, I got really, I got really, really good at growing things and I thought this is awesome, this is going to help my family. Um, around that same time, I started working at um, Voluntary as a um, family support worker for Birthright, which is a um, solo parent organisation. Um, I had a couple of kids already and I was quite confident in um, taking care of us and so they paired me with all the young mums and um, I'd done that job for uh, about eight and a half years. I really loved it. Um, they offered me the, the coordinator job every single six months and I just thought, no, I just don't want to, I don't want to work. I would just rather go and contribute and then you know, take my kids with me. One day I went to uh, a girl's house. She had one little boy who was four months old, I think, at the time. Um, she was older than me by maybe three or four years and um, this was my first meeting with her. And I went into her house and um, she was feeding him cold spaghetti from a, ta a, a tin can. And I said, not baby spaghetti either, just, you know, straight out of a, an adult size can or whatever it is. And I said to her, what are, you, what are you feeding your baby? And she said, oh, it's spaghetti. It's really cheap. And I said, you can't, your baby can't even eat that food. Yeah, he's going to have a reaction to that. I was like, you can't. You need to put that away. He can't actually eat that. And she said, well, what else am I supposed to feed him? And I said, well, how about we go and make some vegetables? And she said, well, I don't even have vegetables. I don't even eat vegetables. And I was like, whoa. And I left the room and I burst into tears and I was just like, this is actually really hard. And um, I had a bit of time to compose myself and I thought, you know, I don't want to take this girl's money away from her. She doesn't, um, she doesn't know, she actually doesn't know. And so I went back into her and I said, come on, let's get in the car, we'll go to the supermarket and go and get some food for the baby. And she said, oh, yeah, no, I don't actually like the tin stuff. It's too expensive. I said, no, we're going to make the food. We're going to make it with vegetables. And she said, oh, can you do that? And I was just like, oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> I only had like, I had no money on me, I had like maybe four bucks, something like that. Um, and I was like, okay, this is, we're getting half a pumpkin, a kumara and a potato, because that's all the money that I had. 
and um, she said, oh, okay. Um, I said, okay, I have to drop you off now, but this is actually what I'm gonna teach you how to make baby food. And she said, yep, that's cool. So I said, oh, but I have to come back tomorrow and my kids are tired and I had to get them home. I went around the next day and she greeted me at the door, like really excited. And um, she said, oh, you'll be really proud of me. And I said, oh, this is so cool, what's going on? And she said, oh, just come sit down, I'll make us a cup of tea. And I said, yeah, okay then. And then she came back from the kitchen and I said, is something burning in the house? And she said, oh, no, 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 everything's so. fine. I said, no, I can, something's burning. Have you got something on the heater or something like that? And she said, no, it's all right. I was like, okay, I'm going to go and investigate because this is freaking me out. And um, I went into her kitchen and the pot was just black fumes coming up everywhere. And I said to her, lots of swear words, but uh, I said to her, um, get a lid. And she was like, I don't have a lid. I was like, oh my God. So I like, opened up the window and threw the pot outside. And I said to her, what the hell is in that pot? And she said, the pumpkin. I said, but it was smoking. She said, well, how, how, how am I supposed to cook? And I said, you're supposed to put water in the pot. And she turned around and she said, well, you didn't tell me that. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is actually diabolical. And I said to her, where's your mother? Like, who, why have you not got any skills? Why do you not know anything? And she said, oh, you know, told me her story and, I just lost the plot and I was just like, this is actually just not good enough. This is not good enough that no one has spent 10 minutes of this girl teaching her that you have to put water into a pot. And I was just like, okay, that's it. That was actually her only pot. I was like, get in the car, you're coming to my house. And so we packed her baby up and packed his blankets up and I was like, you're actually coming to stay with me for a week and I'm gonna teach you how to be a mother. So it was totally against the rules as well, totally against the rules. And um, we didn't dare t tell the case worker what was happening. But and my husband come home and there's just babies and food and pots and crying girls all over the couch and stuff. And um, I said, I actually really want to teach you how to do things so that I don't have to come and visit you again. That you, you know, that you are capable of doing those things yourself. And she said, I'm really scared of being a mum. And I was like, oh. And, um, and I wished that she was the only one that I had met like that, but she, she actually wasn't. And I mean, she was my most extreme case of actually not knowing how to do very much. But um, I had lots and lots of women like that. And what it, it really showed me that there's such a huge disconnect in our generations that, um, you know, skills, just normal everyday skills that you should be teaching your children are missing and that, um, you know, they have really serious implications, especially to her, you know, to her son, the next generation down. So I had this one, um, so obviously I was doing my stuff at home and um, getting, you know, more skills under my belt. I didn't really know how to, to do um, very much, so I started um, stalking all these old ladies and making them my friends. And um, I collected this little wee granny brigade that I called them. And I was like, we're really young and thick, can you teach us stuff? And they're like, yes, we can. We would love to teach you young, thick girls things, because they, <laughs> they just thought that we're stupid, you know? And we really were. And um, they're like, put on a penny, we're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, so I started like running these groups from uh, one of my friend's houses where we have all of our grannies come in and they teach us different things. And it was so awesome and they were so bossy and we were really scared of them, but um, <laughs> they imparted so much knowledge into us. And you know, apart from like learning how to, like I learned to preserve and bottle and make chutneys and jams and everything from scratch, um, sources, you name it, like I was just like, bring it on, I'm ready for this knowledge. I, I've, I've got to give it out to the community, so I need to have it first. And um, the real gold is the in-between times when we were cooking, like the, the still moments that you get to have a one-on-one -on -one with one of them, and they really impart their values to you. And it was really amazing. Um, we've done that for about six months. 
Some of my friends thought that I was really crazy and didn't want to come to these things with me um, because I thought it was really uncool. But um, I just knew that, that that was something that I had to add to my skill set. Um, half of my, and I always say this to everyone that, um, you know, I was learning about ferments and half my friends were at the pub drinking ferments at that time. So it was a real, um, a real pivotal sort of moment for me. I was young and in my 20s and learning all of these things that, you know, all the old ladies could teach me and my friends are just like, what the hell are you doing? You're such a heavy. Um, so I just, I, I stayed on that path because I knew it was actually where I wanted to go. Fast forward um, a few ladies later and I met this one really challenging lady who had a huge backyard. She was in a state, um, a state home, but her section was absolutely massive. And, um, I, and she said to me, oh, can I borrow five bucks off you to go and get some groceries? You know, all the stuff that you're not allowed to do when you work for these places, but you do, because you know, you do. And I said, yeah, all right then. And she said, um, I've got another couple of bucks so I can get some smokes. I was like, I'm not buying you smokes. I was like, why have you got no food in the house? And she said, oh, you know, it's not payday yet. And I said, yeah, I can understand that. I said, look at your big section outside, it's, hu it's humongous. I was like, it's twice the size of my section at home. I was like, let's put a garden in there. And she's like, no, I don't want to do that. And I said, well, you know, what are you going to spend buying some vegetables today? You could totally could grow those and save heaps and heaps of money. And, you know, it's just right there for you and your kids. Anyway, I had to twist her arm, but, um, and that took quite, a, quite some time. I turned up back to her house the next day with my shovel and my fork and my spade and my weed eater. And I was like, let's do this. And she was like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing it. And I was like, get in the garden with me. And she was like, no, I was like, you can't even feed your kids, get in the garden. And she was like, no, I'm not. I was like, I'll stuff you then. I just like dug up the whole backyard. <laughs> I was so annoyed. And, um, and she was swearing at me, giving me the fingers, smoking, just carrying on like a lunatic. And I said, get in here, so it's really good for your character. And she was like, F you, Jade, I told you not to do that. I'm ringing housing corporation on you to tell them that you're ripping up my backyard. I was like, they told me I could. And she was like, you're lying. I totally was lying, but um, she didn't know that. I was like, get in this garden. She's like, no, anyway, I just kept on doing it. Um, and I would just go around and start, I started planting things out. And um, she was still swearing at me one day. I went around there and I had some silver beech plant. And she was really drunk when I got around there and she started abusing me and she said, um, don't you put those effing cabbages in my garden. I said, that's silver beet, like this. And she was like, I'm going to attack you with that spade. Anyway, it was really hilarious. I was like, um, I'm just going to do it because your kids have got no food and I actually don't care what you say. And she was like, oh, you're not my friend anymore. I was like, oh, I'm not your friend anyway, so I'm not worried. Anyway, I consistently kept on turning up to her house every single week and putting more and more food into her garden. One day I turned up unannounced and she was in the garden. And I said, oi, what are you doing in there? You better not be taking those veggies out. <laughs> and she said, oh, I'm watering them. You're doing a shit job like this. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my gosh. Anyway, um, after that, it took me probably nearly eight months to get her in there and participating in the garden. Her kids were loving it. She could go and pick things. Her kids knew most of the names of things. Um, that's the only time I've done that because I learnt my lesson from her. But I come home and, and you know, I was telling my husband, Wiki, all of these horror stories and he's like, don't even go around there, she's going to kill you one day, like, you know. And I said, this is so much energy that one person is putting into getting someone else gardening. I can't obviously sustain this, you know, and she's a nutter anyway, so, you know, I don't know what I'm actually going to get. <laughs> and I was actually probably being the nutter, but anyway. Um, and so he said, oh, do you want to, is this actually something that you want to do? Do you want to keep helping people to grow food at home? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, oh, yeah, um, you should think about how you can do that. And I thought, yeah, I actually really need to think about how I'm going to do this <laughs> instead of just, you know, ripping out someone's backyard. Um, so I sat down and had a, you know, a light bulb moment, God inspired, whatever you want to call it. And... Um, 
and I thought there needs to be a way that we can support young families with a mentor like me um, who actually spends that time. But then how they're going to afford to do it, if, especially if they're in a position of um, being quite tight on their finances. So I come up with this idea, which I then birthed into an organisation called Hand Over a Hundy. So what we do is we sponsor uh, a family $100 worth of resources. Um, we match them up with a mentor who then takes them through a whole year of learning how to grow food at home. It's awesome, it works, um, it's been going for six years now. We, we're still running in Christchurch. It has its ups and downs and part of the co for us was that the whānau had to pay $100 on to then give to another family. That can be a bit dicey sometimes, not knowing where, it, where it, um, you know, what the situation is with them. But as a whole, it really highlighted that um, we need to, as a community, actually make space for that. You know, make space for people learning to grow food at home. It's really important. And um, we need to figure out ways that logistically and um, sustainability, you know, that how we can go forward with that. So um, I've been in that space for a long time. Um, I started learning lots about permaculture and sustainability and seed saving. Um, I've got a really amazing team that sits on the board with me um, who run, um, well, I've got Kay Baxter who runs the Kuanga Institute. I've got um, Sam Judd who runs Sustainable Coastlines. Um, I had Sam Johnson who was the leader of the um, Student Volunteer Army in Christchurch. And I've got Sha Weapu who works with Ngati Fatua in, in Auckland. So everyone's really passionate about where the product starts from, from the sea to make sure that it doesn't go into waste. So um, we're changing the structure of what we're doing with that. But what learning all about that kind of stuff um, led me on to um, talking about it all the time and um, inspiring others to think about how we are contributing to um, food reduction and, and, and food waste and um, just putting a real conversation and the spotlight on that particular conversation um, because let's face it, we all know kids going hungry, you know, and it's not cool and it's actually not acceptable because we've got the land and the resources and the knowledge and now, you know, the generation who knows all of this stuff, we've got it all here, we actually need to start diverting all of that into, into the next generation. So, um, a couple of years ago, a girlfriend of mine sent me through, I was still doing this work, I opened up an environment centre in Ashburton um, with my five kids, because I'm crazy like that, which I was also homeschooling, um, and it was just, life was just really, really awesome and crazy, and um, my friend sent me through an application, she said, this really suits you to have a look at this application that says, dream as big as you can and um, and see where that can take you. And I looked over this application, it was for, um, sorry, I'll actually just go back a wee bit and just say that all of my hand over handy work that I had done was all voluntary, none of it had been paid. Um, but the blessing out of all of that as well is that I started writing for magazines and doing different things so I could use those skills to at least help contribute something to the family then um, because my husband was bankrolling me the whole entire time. Every conference that I had to speak at, all of that, he would pay for all of that because he believed in me, believing in, you know, in, in my passion and, and what I wanted to do around food. So um, I looked over this application and it was for the launch of um, a whānau order, um, Te Wai Pounamu, Te Pūtahitanga, launching in, um, in Te Wai Pounamu, which is a whānau order commissioning agency. And I hadn't done funding before, and so, and I didn't think that I needed to, but I actually had got to a stage as well where I thought I could accelerate this if there's something actually financially backing me to at least, you know, take some of those things away from um, that are liabilities to me, like my time, like my husband putting that resource in, um, which means that, you know, I can't do other things, blah, blah, blah. So we put this application in and, um, and, my, and my, actually my, my idea when I first started was to have a high order centre, like somewhere where we could um, meet, 
exercise, learn about food, rungawa, incorporate all of this um, amazing knowledge that was really dwindling um, into, into one sort of epicenter of it. And it got accepted. And I was like, what? Oh my gosh, this is crazy. Um, so the vision of it changed because they said, you know, this is, this is really cool and you are really dreaming big, like it was, you know, like, like it had said. But they said, you know, um, is there something that you specifically want to focus on? And I said, yeah, actually, I want to focus on social enterprise. That's actually what I really want to do. So they said, how, how can you rewrite your business plan and, and your goals and your, your co-papa around, we know that you want this, but how can you start somewhere to then build into this? And so um, I thought, well, you know, I love growing food. I love educating people about food. I love eating food. It's all I do. It's all I talk about. Shouldn't I just have a cafe that grows food that's a social enterprise? So I made one in Christchurch. Uh, so we moved the whanau up to Christchurch and started looking around. And it was really difficult. It's, you know, still quite a broken city. Um, and we thought, how is this going to fly there? Uh, especially now that um, there's a few barriers in our way, like really expensive um, leases for buildings, um, access, you know, somewhere accessible to have food growing. Um, how can people access us if the city is still so fragmented? You know, how all of these sorts of things. So we linked up with another organisation, and Louis, um, who's from Christchurch, um, Louis. The farm that he was working on, much like our site, they're leased sites from an organisation called Life and Vacant Spaces. So what they do is they broker empty lots around the city um, and creatives normally are the ones that put ideas through to um, say, oh, we want to do an art installation here or we want to do something that's... Um, like, you ha has anyone seen our dance o mat that we've got down there? Like, you go and, you know, put two bucks in and have a boogie and, you know, like those sorts of really cool things that they do with this temporary space. And I said, oh, look, this is an idea that I've got. Have you got any land free? And they said, oh, whoa, this is, you know, can you scale it down? And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't. And they're like, you're like asking for like, 800 square metres of land. I was like, yeah, have you got any around? <laughs> and they're like, I was like, I can see it everywhere. They're like, yeah, but that's not all of ours. I was like, okay, well, this is, you know, if this is going to work, this is what I, this is, this is the dream, really. And um, they said, oh, come and have a look at this one site. And it's just down the road from where Louis was working. So I used to see that little bin system go up and down my street all day long. Um, and I went and had a look at this one space in um, its central city. It's got a $4 million price tag on the land. Um, it's owned by the council. It used to be the convention centre there. And they said, how about this? And I said, I'll take it. <laughs> um, and so we're in a lease with these guys. We've been actually um, in a lease agreement with them for a year. And, um, but we have a 30-day roll around um, kick us off the property, which is quite hard to work that into a quite out there business plan already. So what that entails is um, a developer could come at any time, the council could want that land back, um, and we have 30 days to move everything off the property. So we had some challenges, you know, really thinking in that paradigm of how we can be there, but not really put our, you know, not really ground ourselves in. So uh, because of those restrictions and because there was limited um, access to services and, and things there, we had to really think about um, how do we set up but actually bring it, you know, take it all back up again if we can. So um, I'm just going to go to the next slide over here. So this is what we made. We've got 280 square metres of marakai out the front. It's all organic. It's all organic um, compost, soil, uh, seedlings, seeds, macrocarpa gardens. There's 14 of those 20 metre long beds there. 
um, and this is actually not a very good photo, but here is our cafe seating area in the back here. All of it is temporary. The whole thing can be unscrewed and, okay, not very easily, but it can be unscrewed and moved. My, um, my seating, my indoor seating area here, we've got 40 that we can sit out on the deck there, but our indoor seating area is on wheels, wind for us, no council consent. Is anyone from the council here? Um, I, I went and I seen the council and I said, you know, this is really difficult to know what to do around consents because we actually have to leave again, you know. And they said, um, what are you going to do because, you know, we like taking money off people. I said, I'm not going to give you anything at all. They're like, how are you going to do that? I said, I'm going to put everything on wheels. They're like, I didn't pay them a dollar. I didn't have to because everything is movable. So it's such a great way of having something still but not having to fix it in. Um, so you can't see, but to the left of here, we've got a, um, a commercial kitchen, but it's in a very, very large movable uh, kitchen, much like a caravan, but a, a, a high spec one. It's got solar power on it that powers um, most of our kitchen. Um, that's a really awesome addition because it means that if we did have to pack up in 30 days, that we could pack most of the stuff but go and actually sell from that as well. So we're you know, really thinking about how to most maximise every single part of what we had there. Out of our gardens, um, we opened in February this year, the end of February this year. Uh, out, we've eaten every single day out of those gardens for the cafe it is over 70% of what we actually put out every day from, straight from our gardens. Winter was a bit cruel to us, it was a bit cold down there. Um, and, you know, sometimes things fail, so we had to mitigate all of that risk as well, but it's, um, it's really paid off for us having lots of our food there. It really connects our customers with us. Um, if we have kids that come which we have often, but um, if they're being annoying to their parents, which they can be sometimes, I'll be like, here's a bowl, let's go and get some flowers out of the garden. And we go out and the parents are like, yay, keep them out there for an hour. Um, and you know, it just, it, it makes those connections really worthwhile when people come in. You have to go through the gardens to get to the back of the cafe anyway. So there's no way that they can't connect with it and see it growing as they're walking in. It's really amazing. Um, the neighbourhood that we're in, uh, there's a public light or a temporary public, most things are temporary in Christchurch at the moment, so there's a, um, a temporary library across the road from us, it's been operating for about three years. Um, the central library split into two different places and that's one half of it. Um, we're kind of in between the red light district, if you can say so, still, um, of Manchester Street. We're only a couple of uh, streets down there from, from there. So quite often it can be quite a volatile area. Uh, when you're going in, this was just complete rubble. When we were there, it's just completely concreted ground, um, you know, big stony concrete ground. When you're going in there, that it was quite a heavy area, especially for homeless. Um, we've got a really huge homeless community in Christchurch. Uh, they're mainly Māori men and uh, mainly over 50. So um, because of that, um, a lot of the prostitutes come down and use the library to wash. And so, you know, it can be quite, a, um, quite volatile. They get picked up and dropped off there a lot as well. Um, so sometimes there's fights and, you, you know, when you're going in there that, that could actually not bring customers in, having that atmosphere around. And so we thought, well, we better meet our neighbours. You know, what better way to say that we're coming in? So I made up some white bait patties, put it in some bread, and I was like, hey, neighbours, would you like a white bait patty? They're like, oh, hell yeah, we haven't had this for years and years. And I was like, we're moving in across the road, and um, this is what we're doing. It's, it's mainly organic, mouldy mouldy cuisine. Um, I was like, do you guys want to help? And they're like, yeah, we do, actually. So when we started building all of our gardens, all of our infrastructure that went in, we had around 18 homeless men help us for five and a half weeks or eight hours a day. And they were absolutely 
so invested into Kākano and what we stand for. Um, it was really hard for us taking that relationship out once we actually had to open the doors um, because obviously it changes lots of things. Um, but they take care of my gardens for me. They deter people from the place. Um, I've, got, I've got palisade fencing and then I've got like this, you know, entrance. And I had two um, two by fours, that was my gate, because like I was just like, I'm not putting a gate on this place. Like, you know, someone needs to come in and steal my food. They obviously are hungry and they want to eat it, so I'm not going to lock them out. And everyone was like, put, put, a, put a gate on your place. This is really, you know, two pieces of wood are really crazy. And I said, no, I don't want to... Um, I'm not worried. I'm not worried about it at all. So all my homeless boys are like, we'll do security for you. <laughs> I was like, okay then. So every night they sweep through with their dogs on their way to go and sleep somewhere for the night. So they really take care of our place. Uh, awesome extra parts of our team there. Um, we never envisioned going into this would, you know, would be our community. Um, having us there, lots of the other businesses and um, community say that they feel safer going into the library because they know that someone's right across the road there, whereas it's been quite a gaping hole um, of space with lots of people coming in and out. Um, before we got there, there's lots of people just freedom camping there on the space, um, you know, going to the toilet on the ground, like, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So we've really um, enhanced the manner of the place, which is really cool. Um, which we didn't foresee, you know, going into business that we're going to have this much of a, an, you know, an impact on that space. Uh, we've got six staff that we employ. We have a few, um, a few old guys that are homeless that come and do our gardens and um, they don't have bank accounts or IRD numbers, so it's really hard to, to you know, try to um, pay them for their work. That's not cash, so... Um, I just hooked them up with some, you know, lunch and things like that, which is um, which is okay for them. But we're just we're really learning how to um, have impact on the community that's really positive while still doing business. Obviously, you've got to make a dollar, you've got lights to turn on, you know, everything costs. So um, we haven't really had a, a model to, as such, go and learn by. We're kind of making this up as we go along, and. Um, what we're really learning from it is that actually it's all about people. That you know everything is about people, and if you put people first, the abundance of everything else will come. Um, we've been running workshops and classes, and part of our kaupapa at Kākano, which means seed, um, is to equip people with the knowledge of learning how to grow food, but then also what to do with it afterwards, and. Um, it's become a real community hub for people just to hang out. We've got, um, you know, quite a, a, a challenge city. It's really coming out in the people. There's lots of um, anxious and depressed people who um, really need somewhere to spend that time reconnecting that actually heals their body and souls. And so we have um, quite a large group of um, <coughs> customers that just come in to do the garden from the, um, there's a mental health clinic down the road from us and they have um, just workshops around anxiety and depression and they come down and do gardening with me and it just, you know, it's such a medicinal, amazing tool to use and you get to eat food as well, so it's, you know, it's, it's really cool. Um, what that really has taught us is that everyone wants to start somewhere but you actually have to show them the way as well. And, um, and just to, you know, not furiously go and dig up their backyard, but, um, <laughs> which is actually a good idea, um, but that um, we can do business like this. This is actually a totally doable model for anyone. And um, what it does is co it connects our community. We have um, koanga that come in, we have um, schools, we have other businesses, we have our model, uh, our model is built around um, a, a social focus that whatever profit that we make we're redistributing that profit back into food resilience and food sovereignty. 
those are our two main things that we're going to um, to be focusing on. So for example, we make lots of money next year because I'm totally putting it out there that we're going to. Um, say if Arno comes and needs a wheelbarrow or needs a hose or needs some tools, there's going to be a grant funding available for them that we've got a, a totally different board that will make those decisions that is going to contribute to their food resilience and food security. So um, if that's seeds, if that's um, you know, anything around them empowering their own whānau to take care of themselves at home or school, wherever they are, that's exactly what we're going to be investing our, our profits into. So by doing that, we're going to be building a better and resilient community, which is in turn obviously going to be healthy. Um, I've been doing a bit of research. We've been working with lots of organisations, especially, yeah, especially Māori um, organisations who um, are trying to have a, a bit of a linkage between um, not having enough food and the effects of that, um, especially across generationally. So a study that I seen the other day that has been conducted um, directly links food insecurity or food insufficiency at home with suicide. And, you know, that's, it's just actually not good enough. It's not good enough that we have all of this um, lack because look at the repercussions of what it's doing to our people. And that's, you know, that's, that's one part of it. Um, the health and obesity and heart, heart disease, all of that, that's another part of it. You know, there's kids going to school that are hungry, they're not learning, that's another part of it. You know, there's so much that can actually be dealt with by having enough food, and it needs our urgency. So, um, I think I'm going to wrap up there. Mm -hmm. And are we having questions afterwards, are we? Yep. yep. We've got a half hour session. Okay. But is there anything quickly that anyone wants to know? So you that grant, that yep. funding that you got, yeah, so that's um, not all of it. We've um, we've had uh, we've applied for some other funding through Sustainable Initiatives Fund. So our co-papa around um, Kākano is that we grow as much of it as we can. We use organic and local producers. Uh, all of our um, serving and everything is completely biodegradable. All of it, like it's the newer stuff that we've got on the market. So we've got a. Um, a zero waste policy that's not quite there yet but we have to take all of our water off the property every day because we actually don't have infrastructure of, of drains there so um, all of that other stuff is we're actually considering a compost toilet as well. Can the water go into the um, No, no it can't because we don't, we um... Because it's green water. Yeah, yeah and the site and, and you know the council are pretty about that so we have asked already but um, so we actually have to take all of our resources off the property all the time because the resources aren't there so uh, we feed all of our scraps go out to chickens um, on a organic farm out in Canterbury we get the eggs back so we like smash that cycle out so we feed those guys they feed us it's a real happy relationship um, we Try, we're really trying to have zero waste at all, which is actually really quite difficult in hospitality. It's mental, you know. Um, I go foraging for a lot of things as well. So, you know, there's lots of things that um, we're actually saving money on. Um, that, yeah, so while we have received um, help with this, it hasn't completely done everything. So, and it's, and it's an ongoing thing as well. Like I say, we've got lots of staff. Um, our, you know, our overheads are quite high, um, and we're just doing mouldy inspired food, which is really radical for there as well. Um, but I don't do coffee, which is also really radical and annoys people like me who need coffee sometimes. Um, just for the, just for those reasons that you know, we have to take the waste off. That we don't want to have plastic milk bottles lying around everywhere. That we want people to experience petal and chai and kawakawa tea and you know our stuff rather than other things so um, yeah it's a, a bit of a radical system we got going on but um, it really is affecting change in our community and we're very thankful and grateful for the opportunity so yeah yeah oh, sorry, um, what do you, um, off -base 
Yeah, so we do we do cold press juices that we make there. Um, so all of all of that is organic. We do um, juices, we do tea tonics, we do hot teas and um, smoothies. So just the good stuff that feeds our bodies. Yeah. So do you, you're allowed to compost those? Um, yeah, 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 we can, we can but um, because everything in our system is so new, yeah. we've brought all of that in fresh anyway. So we don't, you know, we don't, and we know that when we're going to be moving to the next site that we're considering at the moment, mm -hmm. that um, that might allow for that. Mm -hmm. But the thing, um, the thing with that is, is you know, there's rodents in the city as well, and we're wanting to eliminate some of those risks because it's so open now. You know, there's there, there can be problems with those sorts of things, so we're trying to minimise that as much as we can. I mean, it would be a great idea to compost, but like I say, you know, there's there, it's not the right system, I don't think, um, for us at the moment. But I mean, the chickens are getting our our food scraps anyway, and they're the best fed chickens in Christchurch as far as I'm concerned. And you said um, weather-wise, yeah. and Oak Christchurch had a little rough snow in the middle of winter, so do you, what, do you have Yeah, 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 we do, but like we spend lots of time in the garden. Yeah. Like, you know, we're observing it every single day as well, so we're really connected to what could, it's, it's actually quite a harsh, um, well, it's really harsh there because as you can see, like we've, we, there's, there's no trees, that's all open. We hand water every single day. And I know that's a tedious job, but I actually really, it's, it's wonderful for us because we get to, you know, there's people that don't even come in that walk straight across, you know, and we, we're interacting with people all the time. And if we had a sprinkler on, yeah. we wouldn't have to, you know, and it's just, it's about making those connections each and every time that you possibly can, it's really important. So, I better sit down now. Yeah, it's awesome, and it just it, like it really makes you look at what's going on in front of you. You can't, you know, you can't escape it. So, that other cool picture that I had on before, that was one day I made a salad and I got. 50 something, that's 50 different things from my garden. So, I mean, that's an opportunity that we have, you know. All right, I'm going to sit down now. Jasmine's giving me the look. Kia ora.